you, Chris, for a wonderful uh, talk. I'm sure uh, it will generate <coughs> a very lively discussion. Um, um, our next speaker is Dr. Tamar Novik. Uh, Tamar Novik is trained as a historian of science and writes about agriculture, technology, animals, and fertility research in Palestine and Israel. She's a senior research scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, where she leads a, a work group on animals and knowledge. Her forthcoming book, uh, which will be published with uh, MIT Press, is entitled Milk and Honey, Technologies of Plenty in the Making of a Holy Land. Um, the book examines how European settlers in Palestine use science and technology to literally reconstruct uh, a land flowing with milk and honey uh, with the bodies of humans and animals. Her current research focuses on the history of urine and on uh, the use of bodily waste in science more broadly, and uh, the presentation today is part of that project, right, I assume. So. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm so happy also to speak uh, at this p panel. I think uh, our uh, two presentations are uh, both beautifully um, complementary and have interesting differences. So um, I'll start now. On one evening in November 1881, John Gregory Burke, Lieutenant General in the American Army, stationed in New Mexico, found himself surrounded by a dozen semi-naked dancers who offered him a sip of human urine. Members of the Zuni people were performing a special dance in which they drank urine by the jug and mocked the practices of the colonialists in the room. This event, which he found appalling and physically intolerable, changed his life. As a result of the experience that seemed so strange and indeed disgusting, Burke began collecting stories and evidence of the use of urine in ritual and medicine of all cultures and religions, and presented his finding to the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1885. So this became a topic of scientific research. His full collection of the uses of urine and excrement was published 10 years after that foul experience under the title, Scatologic Rights of All Nations. The book became a stellar. One of his readers, albeit not the only famous one, was Sigmund Freud, who then used this ethnographic and historical evidence in formulating his revolutionary ideas about psychosexual development. To Freud, evidence about the role of urine in communities such as the Zunis was considered comparable to the behavior of infants and useful in understanding the development of the human species. In the preface of the 1913 German translation of Burke's book, which was titled Das Buch den Unras, The Book of Filth, Freud claims, so he wrote the preface, that it's an established fact that, and I quote, the human infant is obliged to, recapulate, to recapi recapitulate during the early uh, part of the development the changes in the attitude of the human race toward extramental matters, which, probably had their start when Homo sapiens first raised themselves off of Mother Earth. So distancing our noses from the ground was an important step toward a new relationship of separation from the lower gut and its products. So our noses are important here. Such senses, uh, sorry, such scenes of urine and use were appalling to the turn of uh, the 20th century white man as it is to us because we consider urine to be nuisance, a substance to be discarded of, as we just heard. Indeed, we might say that the domestication of the toilet, the system that allows for the discard and disappearance of our bodily waste in the privacy of our own home, is the crux of modernity. 
Instead of, this, sorry, instead of discarding, the talk today will focus at collecting waste. Historians of science, such as myself, are very interesting, interested in collections, be they the curiosities of nature to inhabit the cabinet or specimens of the world's plants and animals for museum displays. I want to complement these with other stories of collecting and in addition to Bort's comprehensive collection of the uses of urine, to look at the practices of collecting urine itself. In the 20th century, sorry, early 20th century, collecting urine became a business and collection campaigns have intensified throughout the century. This has been happening as part of the expansion of the reproduction sciences, as largely as the result of the scientific work of an old human protagonist of mine, a German gynecologist and endocrinologist named Bernard Sondek. In the early years uh, of uh, hormone research in the 20s and 30s, everyone was searching for biological sources to extract hormones for the production of fertility drugs. These included ovaries, testes, and glands from human and animal bodies, alive or dead. Sondek was pursue, uh, pushing for the use of the unlikely substance of urine, one of the two types of sex hormones produced in the pituitary glands he showed are found in the urine of pregnant women and even more so in the urine of uh, pregnant mares. So this is Tondek and here is a some illustration of how he compared urine of, well actually mares, uh, women, but also stallions. Later developments led to the realization that the urine of women after menopause contained a combination of both types of sex hormones, and so collection of urine was spreading all around, gradually becoming systematized and industrialized. So here are some examples of how collection worked. In the 1940s, for example, Canadian farm workers were struggling to find a solution to collecting urine from mares. Following Sondek's discovery and the fact that urine from pregnant horses was now worth more than milk, farms across Canada started raising horses and trying to get them pregnant. Collecting the urine was a messy business. Initially, workers collected urine from the floor, but it was mixed with feces and dirt and that not, was not very effective. Then, they tried to develop method to catch the urine directly from the mares the moment they started peeing. That turned out to be difficult because there was no, almost no visible sign when that was going to happen. A collection device was then applied close to the mare's genitalia and removed now, every now and again when it was full and the urine was then transported to centers of hum hormone purification to the pharma business. The celebrated and controversial German novelist and playwright Hans Henian, who was also an amateur chemist, also became very interested in sex hormones in the 1940s. And he argued that urine of mares was an elixir of life. He also visited schools in order to collect the urine of young boys, which he then drank himself, but also uh, served, uh, as, uh, treated uh, his lovers. When collecting urine from people, the challenge was of a different nature. Beginning in 1963, hundreds of aging women who lived in elderly homes in central Israel, for example, were asked to urinate into mobile containers and donate the urine towards the Israeli struggle against infertility. Every day, the postmenopausal urine was collected with the help of female caretakers while others removed the traces of otter. The urine was driven in big containers to a local pharmaceutical company where the colon cake absorbed its liquids. Then, in the form of powder, it was sent to the Italian pharmaceutical company named Sorono. There, under partial ownership of the Vatican uh, and already experienced in receiving doses of urine from old Italian nuns, sex hormones were then purified from the powder uh, and made into a highly successful fertility drug, the first to induce ovulation, called per pergonal only to be then sent back to Israel for clinical trials in the governmental hospital of Tel Shomer. The donors from one elderly home noted that they would be very happy to give the urine for this purpose and noted that they, could do, do, they would be happy to increase their urine production if only they would be given more wet watermelons. 
Also in the 1960s, scientists working for the Swedish par pharmaceutical company Leblio uh, needed postmenopausal urine for the same purpose. Urine obtained from European women was too expensive, and so they started looking for cheap urine and contacted the representatives of UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for the Palestinian Refugees in Lebanon in 1966. And this is the document showing part of the correspondence. Their idea was to obtain dosages of postmenopausal urine from the very concentrated population of Palestinian refugees in Gaza. This plan was never materialized. However, urine collection campaigns have since spread across a variety of impoverished communities in the global south, including India, as the work of anthropologist Sandra Perrotta demonstrates. From the early days of sex and endocrinology, and indeed until today, a fundamental portion of fertility drugs have been based on the collection and purification of human and animal urine. This newly d discovered wondrous substance, which was also always there wasteful and interfering, revolutionized reproduction of human and animals around the world. The centrality of bodily waste, such as urine, to global revolutions, a revolution in the management of reproduction, but also in our understanding of the human psyche, as we've seen in the beginning, might seem curious, but in fact, people have been collecting urine for a variety of purposes for a very long time. Urine, we might argue, seemed to have sparked many other older revolutions. For centuries, urine was used for turning wool into garment and for cleaning wool clothes. It was collected most famously from public toilets in ancient Rome for the purpose of cleaning togas and sheets, leading to the urine tax imposed by Emperor, uh, Emperors Nero and Vespasian. The use of urine for scoring wool was at its height in 18th century in Europe, with few urine co collection campaigns lasting as late as, as the end of the 19th century, a time when synthetic solutions had stunned themselves as preferable and as cotton came to the fore as the dominant material for clothes production. Urine was also central for tanning and particularly useful for separating the animal skin from the hair. Pots positions at, positioned at street corners of main uh, European cities in early modern period were collected daily and taken to centers of the production of leather. Dyeing practices including the use of distilled urine across cultures. In the 1790s, for example, 300 gal gallons of urine were collected daily from the streets of Glasgow for the purpose of extracting purple dye from sea lichens, hence capturing about 20% of the city's daily urine output for that project alone. Urine was also used to produce gum powder and, like manure, has been highly valued as a fertilizer. Many made their fortune from selling urine for agricultural purposes. It was so highly valued that across Western Japan during the, uh, during, um, the Meiji period, local political powers fought about the rights over public urinals. These became contested spaces when subjected to sabotage. With great potential profit, arguments about controlling urine as well as urine theft were topics frequently addressed in local courts. Urine was commonly used for studies in alchemy. In 1666, alchemist Henning Brand of Hamburg, who failed to turn urine into gold, discovered phosphorus instead, which made the urine glow in the dark. This dramatic event at the center of what is perhaps the most popular representation of alchemy, or we might say of the Enlightenment. So here is a connection between urine light and revolution. More to the point, phosphorus became a desired material even when, before its application was fully realized. Many wanted to learn from Brad how to produce it. So uh, Leibniz, the philosopher, for example, set up a manufacturing facility in Hanover to, in, uh, to which Brand derived twice, collected about 100 tons of urine each time from military barracks and taught Leibniz how to transform urine into light. With time and with the demand for fertilizers, phosphorus uh, is yet another fundamental material at the basis of the Green Revolution. Urine has also been considered an indicator, especially for human health and disease. Some medical traditions consider urine a window into the body, potentially revealing its secrets. Such understanding was at the basis of uroscopy, a practice of the visual examination of the patient's urine with the naked eye, but also with the finger, the nose, and the tongue, which had an outstanding place in pre-modern European medicine. 
Finally, the consumption of one's own urine or the urine of others has been known to cure a variety of ailments across cultures. Quixi, for example, a drug prepared from, the, from urine was used frequently throughout Chinese history and also alchemy, actually. Urine and hair management and styling is a whole other aspect, so I won't say much about this, but you might, uh, you might have heard of the Venice Blonde that was pretty prominent in Renaissance Italy, or the still uh, contemporaneous uh, uh, use of camel urine in the Arabian Peninsula. Drinking the urine of animals or urine who consumed hallucinatory substances, furthermore, has been used as an easy, cheap, or safe way to get under the influence. One famous example is that of the Siberian shamans who drank the urine of deers, who themselves ate a hallucinatory mushroom called the fly agaric. In the mid 20th century, Gordon Wesson, a banker and amateur ethnomycologist, so that is a mushroom expert, used this ethnographic evidence from, from Siberia and Eastern Europe to make an argument about um, the um, uh, the category of Soma of the great Indian Vedas. So he, he argued that if you look at Siberian practices, you can clearly see that in uh, ancient Indian cultures, um, hallucinatory uh, mushrooms uh, were uh, consumed via urine as well. So hopefully by now, after I presented you with my humble collection, you're convinced that urine flows everywhere, or at least it used to that this substance that, was, uh, that we all know pretty intimately and probably never thought could have any meaning or use could and in fact was pretty significant. This history of use and, cha and value challenges some assumptions about trash and the limits of the body. It illustrates how the waste of the body, along with many other materials deemed futile, was invented in modernity. This invention had far-reaching cultural, technological, and environmental consequences. Letting go of the value of bodily materials meant that recruiting uh, precious resources such as water to separate, hide, and discard of them. Losing their value, they became sensorial nuisance, exposing feelings of disgust and repulsion, including among those who later claimed to have discovered them, such as Burke in his unforgettable visit to the Zunis. My own discovery of urine emerged as part of my attempts to situate hormone research in a particular geopolitical context, that of the European settlement project in Palestine and Israel in the first half of the 20th century. The efforts to expand this settlement meant that reproduction of both humans and animals was key and the growing problem of settlers' infertility the ultimate threat. Bernard Sondek, the renowned scientist I mentioned earlier, immigrated from Germany to Palestine in 1934 and established a community of hormone researchers there. An examination of, his, of the work of his circle shows the extent to which questions of fertility reach beyond the human to include farm animals. This is also how aging women and pregnant horses got their part in the project and the, as the urine helped to solve infertility uh, across settlers, humans, and, uh, and livestock alike. So I'm just going to summarize very quickly what I mean here. Uh, any settlement project it relies on management of, of population. In, in this context, uh, uh, as the milk was defined at the center of the agricultural economy, the reproduction uh, uh, of cows and, uh, and other livestock such as sheep became very crucial beyond the reproduction behavior of, of humans. And then with environmental uh, challenges that come with the increased production of milk and fertility emerges in one of the central questions or problems to, well, both human, demog uh, human demographic questions but in, in the farms. And, and so when uh, Tsonde came with his realization that urine can solve all these problems, it's, they, um, uh, at, well, tr locally trained experts began transporting urine between, um, well, horses, women, sheep, and, and cows, and so on. So they would basically take urine and inject it to these female creatures uh, to solve infertility problems. So Tzondek defined the, uh, and, con and uh, consequently made urine a substance of value in a world and a period in which it, ha it had none or nearly none. 
This nicely illustrates how ways the so-called matter out of place is historically contingent. At the turn of the 20th century, treating urine as a material value seemed uh, curious, uh, provocative, as Chris noted. This came with a price, however. Uh, while animal bodies and their waste became very useful for solving environmental, economic, and political problems, they were considered highly dangerous to the point of concealing. Their reaction to this type of scientific work, uh, if you look through pub their publications, for example, reveal an ever-growing anxiety about the use of urine, especially when it comes from an unknown human or animal source. They show an underlying thread of mixing different kinds of creatures and, even more so, polluting, uh, the polluting powers uh, uh, to human bodies. So here are two, um, two examples of such publication that dealt with this problem and that, um, and that have an, uh, a tone uh, that demonstrates such anxieties and arg by arguing uh, um, that yours is in fact safe for use, uh, especially if you use human urine for humans. With such fears about the waste of the bodies, fantasies emerge regarding the possibility of developing synthetic cures. The lure of producing synthetic drugs to treat infertility, uh, but also for the effects of menopause, emerged in that period and continued to occupy the scientific community until today. Uh, these are uh, called recombinant sex hormones, uh, usually. So this, look at this example from uh, 2002 uh, article called Bye Bye Urinary, uh, urinary Gonadotropins. Gonadotropins are sex hormones produced in the pituitary glands. The use of urine should be discouraged. Uh, discouraged. The question, this question marks, um, uh, um, shows the significance of this, uh, of these fantasies, but also demonstrate that fertility treatment is heavily reliant on bodily waste until this very day. So by this I want to say something about, we've talked in, the, in this workshop, just to comment as I was listening to the presentation, the question of synthetic solutions versus, versus the use of organic matter keeps coming up, and I would say this is perhaps the only point in which I don't agree with Chris is that while the synthetic lore is always there, organic matter continues to be, in fact, in use all the time. So in this sense, the potential utility of urine is not a road not taken. On the contrary, the great acceleration accurately captures the ever-growing global infrastructure for urine collections campaigns for the pharma industry. It is a road certainly taken, expanded, and transformed into what you might call a highway. So, and this highway has this, highway has this particular interesting flow, so it, and as opposed to most ways that moves from the west to the rest, uh, bodily waste moves from the global south northward. But while we might say that the utility of urine was revived after about a century of pure worthlessness, its value changed. Because urine poses a threat of, to modernity, it tends to be used under, sort of undercover. It's, it's hidden, it's disguised, it's something else. Mary Douglas's notion of matter out of place, another road commonly taken, remains useful for thinking about dirt, waste pollution, and wasted people and other animals and their polluting powers. Another useful discussion developed around different regimes of power. Referring to bodily waste in the colonial, post-colonial, and post-humanist context respectively, Warwick Anderson, Joshua Etsy, and Mary Leathers elaborated on this idea of extramental colonialism. They showed how the waste of the body, but they were all writing about feces, everyone is always writing about feces, feet neatly and in, is actually crucial for the construction of such regimes. According to their overall scheme, the rulers, those who are in positions of power, tend to separate themselves from the waste of the body, theirs and of others, while the lives of those who are under control uh, are closer to those wastes. So, rather than being out of place like any ways, the argument here is that the treatment of excrement maps onto the social hierarchy and structure of power. Some are closer to the waste of the body, more, well, closer than others. But both these approaches, matter of a place, and arguments about uh, how bodily waste management reflects structures of power, work as far as we consider urine to be threatening and wasteful. 
considering this long history of urine and use in which it seems to be less out of place and, as I said, its current use as well, we have to consider whether uh, the need to purify hormone, as the process is officially called in so sex endocrinology, and the attempts to conceal the origin of urine are a new phenomenon. Might we consider, furthermore, Burke's repulsion in witnessing other people drinking urine as, historical, as an historical exception. Could the strong smell of urine have not been experienced as disgusting and better yet as pleasurable? A common argument in a growing field of discard study is the idea that waste material is a modern phenomenon. In his research book, Thrifty Science, for example, historian uh, Simon Weret shows that for scientists in the 17th and 18th century in Europe, disposal of research materials was never an option. Scientists recycled, repurposed, and reused all materials available to them in order to learn about the natural world. Waste was a later in invention in that sense. The history of urine and use fits this chronology pretty neatly. Urine was a material collected in use and in many worlds and of practice and meaning until roughly the late 18th century. For about a, uh, from about the early 19th century, it emerged as wasteful, shameful, uh, requiring mechanism of disposal, only to be rediscovered at the turn of the century as a mysterious subject of investigation and use to new spheres of knowledge such as um, sex endocrinology, but also anthropology and psychology. Why did we stop valuing urine, and how did it become the threatening, disgusting, and smelly? Anosmia, also known as smell blindness, is the loss of the ability to, to detect one or more smells. By calling for an, an anosmic history, I mean to propose the possibility of recalibrating our uh, sensorial sensitivity and postponing our immediate assumptions about what is valuable, what is pure, and what is political uh, and sorry and what is polluting thank you